I did. Right. The best time to write is here. Now. The best place to write is you. The best person to write is you. Thank you very much. Give another round of applause for John. <laughs> now, people at home won't see, but we have uh, prompts all around the, the room with uh, different sayings on them. And one of the poems John did is actually one of our prompts. So, Rainbow Feelings for the Win. <laughs> and we should also give John kudos because he was supposed to feature in January and we had a big snow and ice storm and John stuck with us and decided to feature today instead. Uh, let's see, something else to mention. Um, okay, so if you go to the writingnightspress.blogspot.com site, and look under our submissions. We have a current call open for our next uh, Wayward Sword edition. Uh, Wayward Sword is our lit mag that we're um, building, slowly building up steam for. Uh, this next release is uh, titled Break the Mold. We have, a, have a three different um, prompts for it. One of them is uh, the anti-memetic. So if you have like a different, like a style of poetry that a certain poet you like does, the idea is to take that style of poetry and then kind of like turn it on its head, like to keep the style, but maybe do something entirely different with the subject. Like uh, the example we give, uh, what if Emily Dickinson wrote um, a really saucy uh, sex poem instead of like a, a pining for love poem? Just want to have one of those. Um, there's other examples on <clears throat> on the site. Uh, one of them is a uh, persona, like a what if a poem was personified? And there's another one I don't remember at the moment, but that gives you a reason to go to writingnicepress.blogspot.com. So anyway, uh, our next performer, um, it's comic noir as interpretive Ooh. speech and other stranger things. Please welcome Daria Quinn. Fuck yeah! Fuck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> also, uh, for those who are interested in some foreplay, I have a foreplay. Dollar <laughs> each. You can talk to me afterwards. Surprisingly, you're the first person to make that joke. <laughs> really? Yeah, and we've do, we've been doing foreplay since basically the beginning of writing nights, and you're the first person to make that joke. Okay, well. Which is disappointing. I, I guess that us Which means everyone else is way too adult. adult. Right? What the fuck? Okay, well. This is supposed to be fun, man. Hello, my name is Daria Quinn, and I am a god. Not the god, mind you. That's a bit more complicated. Basically, the god is not so much a being as he is a concept. The idea that all there was, is, and ever could be is connected by a single shared origin. And to our knowledge of science and the cosmos, it's true. We all come from hydrogen and carbon and share a common lineage with stars and snails. However, despite all of that, we are unique because we know ourselves. We have a greater understanding of ourselves and the cosmos than any other creature we have ever observed. We've built homes, invented machines, discovered fire and electricity and magnetism and bent them to our will. We have powered our engines through sunlight, water, wind, and the fossilized remains of the dead centuries past. We have forged civilizations, founded nations, built churches and synagogues in tribute to powers beyond our comprehension, yet still managed to hold on to the curiosity of a child and seek out the answers to questions we have only just learned to ask. Our creativity makes us gods, whether it's expressed through art, machinery, science, philosophy, literature, athletics, mathematics. We have always looked at what is and asked ourselves what could be, what, sh what should be. What can we? What can we do different? What can we do better? Can this change? 
And will that change be for the better? And if not, why not? And let's see if we can change that too. We refuse by virtue of our very existence to be shackled to our limitations as we reach towards greatness. We are the culmination of billions upon billions of centuries of nuclear reactions, mutations, adaptations, diversifications, and conceptions. And it is through us that the next great thing in this universe will come to pass, if not by our hands, by the hands of our children's children's children. <laughs> if you are alive and you have a soul, a thought in your mind, and the will to carry it to out, you too are a god. <laughs> was written in response to a friend while visiting a vintage clothes shop. Walking to a vintage clothes store, a friend asked the question, what would you, what era would you be given the choice? I wouldn't, is the honest reply. Nothing in the store fits me anyway. And I'm not, I'm not much for vintage clothes, or for that matter, vintage much of anything. Some of the media of the past is okay, but nothing I'd want to relive. Living in the past era doesn't appeal to me, even if the fashion sense did. I look at the past as a failed experiment, a blueprint, a blueprint for what not to do to enhance the future. I'm not one to fabricate, fabricate and romanticize a past that never once existed and pine for a nostalgia viewed through a prism of pop culture. You want to know what era I'd be? Probably dead in all likelihood, either because I forced myself to live a lie out and off myself or trying to live in truth and got myself killed by a bigot. I don't want to go back to a time that never was or wear the clothes of a culture that suppressed all creative thought. I want to be something different, something better, something new. Something the world hasn't seen yet because everything else has been played out. The aesthetics of the past don't appeal to me because I personally can't separate the fashion from the cultural oppression. I don't want to live in a bygone era. I don't want to live in a time where I don't have to I don't want, I want an era. I want to live in a time where I don't have to hide who I am just to survive. I can't even manage to do that in the present, let alone in the past. What era would I be if given the choice? Hell if I know, it hasn't happened yet. Mm -hmm. bipolar mixed with uh, severe agoraphobia, which means that being up here in front of people is not the happiest thing for me. So here's, a, here's an insight into agoraphobia. I really didn't want to leave the house today, but I've got an appointment with my psychiatrist and I need to go so I can get my meds refilled, but I really don't want to leave this bedroom. I was just out yesterday and it was cold and it was wet and I was miserable. It's not that much warmer today, but I gotta go anyway. Then afterwards, since I already left the house and I'm in desperate need of food and toiletries, I might as well go to Walmart. God, I hate Walmart. Super centers full of yeah. impatient people lollygagging around and constantly standing in the way of the few things I came here for. Just get out of my way long enough so I can hurry up and leave this place. It's too <laughs> noisy and crowded. I can't handle noisy and crowded. It'd be nice if I could just order all this stuff online and have it sent to my house, but it won't work that way. I can order some things online, but they make you come to the store to pick everything else up. Something about laws against mailing perishables. So I have to leave the house and I'm miserable enough and I'm not going... So I have to leave the house and I'm miserable enough. I'm not as bad as Bob Wiley, but I'm often close enough. And if you don't know who that is, it's the character Bill Murray played in the movie called What About Bob? Bob's a severe agoraphobic, can barely leave his house. I'm not quite as bad as that, but I'm often very close. Most people don't understand that. They only see the armor I wear when I leave the house. That is, if they're even really looking. I find most people don't care about your issues. They're just standing in the way. Unfortunately for me, I see people mostly in the same way, except the entire time in my mind when I'm out, I'm on, I'm on super high mega red alert. It's DEF CON 5 and all you want to do is say hi. But it took all my spoons just to make it to the bus stop today. And it, day, my day isn't done yet. So maybe when I don't want to make small talk with a perfect stranger, you take it into a mind and come up as a creeper. 
All I want to do is go home and you're standing in my way. This bus moves too slow. I'm packed in like a sardine and all my spoons and my spoons all got used up several hours ago just walking to the bus stop. I can't wait to get home and be free of this miserable day. No more buses, no more random strangers, no more loud noises, no more Walmarts. Let me turn off my phone and disconnect from the human world. Return to the solace that is my bedroom and YouTube. I'll text some friends tomorrow, let them know I'm still alive, then disappear from the human world for a week or more at a time. Just to build up the strength to be able to go out next Thursday and go to support groups because I can't actually stay in this room and he'll ever leave again. It's simply not that practical. I'm eventually going to need food and toiletries. I am in the process of working on a series of poems I am referring to as Radio Dreams. And they are all song, they are all poems loosely, and I need to stress the word loosely, based on songs. This one was inspired by being down in a basement with some friends in a bookstore. Hey, Daddy-O, I don't want to go down to the basement. They make you think down there about <laughs> queer rights and black lives and how women are people just like you. Hey, Daddy-O, I don't want to go down to the basement. I'd rather stay upstairs with all the bestsellers, books about vampires and kinky sex and girls on fire. I love me some fictionalized girl power, but I don't want to go into the basement where the real girl power is stored. Feminism ain't for me. I can go see the Black Panther movie, but I don't want to read about the real Black Panthers, do I? No, black lives only matter to me on a movie screen. Hey, Daddy-O, I don't want to go down to the basement. They make you think down there, where the books that no one wants to read live. No Pennywise or Sauron's eyes, just the stories of all the queer eyes. Not for the straight guys, but for the queer eyes. Stories of community, fictional and otherwise, that you don't want to see. Because, hey, Daddy-O, I don't want to go down to the basement. The poetry hurts down there. They slam and confront and talk about all the things that everyone wants to bury, like queer rights and black lives and how women are people just like you. These books gather dust and the poet's voice gets drowned out by the bestsellers we sell upstairs. Fifty shades of white privilege and multicultural erasure. Everybody poops, but not everybody should get published. Mm. Some of us are lucky we ever made it to paper at all. Store down in the basement where white eyes and privileged minds will never have to see us. Hey, Daddy O, I don't want to go down in the basement. Mm. Yeah, and that's why. Y'all were there for the, uh, the beta work. version of this. This yeah. was much better. Yeah. I agree. So, um, this is um, oh, another radio dream. This is based on a Smashing Pumpkin song called Pub. Kiss and kill me sweetly, I am yours alone. These words would pour from, rain, from stereo speakers accompanied by synthetic beats as I lived out my teenage emo phase six years before emo went mainstream. Mm -hmm. I didn't have the privilege of the Get Up Kids and Captain Jazz as soundtracks of 90s life. I had Billy Corgan and an underage Fiona Apple getting the Lord kind of success before the Lord kind of success was attainable to just about anyone with a decent internet connection. I wonder if Fiona would have survived her This World is Bullshit moment if she had come out with her first hits in 2013 rather than 1997. Maybe the internet would have kept her relevant even as her music became more avant-garde. As the pawn becomes a queen who never saw it coming, thus began her rule as a royal who'd never be. Kiss and kill me sweetly, I am yours alone. This voice never changes every time I play this song. These words touch the soul of a girl that did not yet know herself, a girl living a life devoted to nothing more than managing the lonely mm. healing one has when you're surrounded by the kind of mediocrity that uses, usually passes as top 40 radio. Mediocrity placed into various human forms inside a prison of brick and mortar, a prison that you are legally required to attend for eight hours a day every single day until you finally manage to lose every bit of sense, intelligence, and individuality you want to possess. And then you can't even make up imaginary friends to comfort you because your imagination is all used up, writing the words on a page that keep you from murdering every last and simply boring mental amputee that dares to share these prison halls with the nightmare that lives inside of me demanding to be set free. Kiss and kill me sweetly, I am yours alone. A nostalgia for a sound that brings me nothing but sadness. Memories of days not meant to be revered by man or beast. 
recorded immortal in my mind for as long as this mind is condemned to remember every single last infected second of those black days spent as the only mind worth a damn, forced to navigate through a cesspool of childish politics and teenage disease in a misguided attempt, attempt to become a fully realized human being. This one is uh, another radio dream, loosely based on the soul coughing song, True Dreams of Wichita. True dreams of Midwest bliss lost among the flyover states and the rare places where freaks like me gather in droves, like the Beatopia from the Blind Melon video. I finally found a place where people like me exist, except they don't. True dreams of Levittsburg, I could never return and call that home because home was never a place I had been, only the places I could imagine in my dreams. I never felt as if I were a permanent, I was always just passing through. The people who are here today would be gone to by next week. Nothing is permanent, nothing is stable, nothing gold ever stays, but neither does anything else. True dreams of Youngstown and stuck with all I've got. Dreams come here to die, and chances are I will too. The only stability here is the inevitability of failure. That's why everyone tries to run away from Ohio. No one stays here because they want to. We stay here because we can't afford to go home anymore. Except Ohio was always home, I guess. Maybe that's why it never felt that way. Mm. True dreams of Wichita, and I have no concept of it. All I know are gray skies, football, and trailer parks. I've spent my entire life believing that I was just passing through, but Ohio won't let me leave you until it takes away every last possible dream I may ever have of Wichita. This is loosely connected to Radio Dreams. This is um, a letter to Fiona Apple. Dear Fiona, I honestly don't know why you became the girl to emulate for me in 1997. I'm just glad you did. They took you seriously at 15, singing songs about things many claimed you hadn't even experienced yet. But you and I knew much better. You had a woman's mind before you were recognized as one, well beyond her years of understanding, yet young enough to still be exploited. I may be the only person here that doesn't particularly care for the song Criminal. Not because, of the not because the experience isn't genuine, not because it's an exclamation of feminine sexuality with depth and nuance, but because of how MTV, the record label, and their handlers took advantage to sell you as a sexy Lolita, something even you seem to be uncomfortable with. I stuck around for As the Pawn, considered fast as you can, a magnum opus. I heard the jealous girls in school call you an anorexic, as if they had any idea what it was like to have a, an artistic soul or the crushing pressure of pop stardom on your shoulders, a pressure you adamantly rejected with perhaps your most famous words, this world is bullshit. To, to be honest, I think I lied. I know why I looked up to you, why you became one of my heroes, because you had to the courage to take your moment in the sun, to tell everyone whose eyes were looking up to you in the light and told them that this world that you were allegedly at the top of didn't actually exist. That fame is fleeting, hollow, and merciless. It's why I didn't hear from you after paper bag. Not for another 10 years, for when a, <clears throat> not for another 10 years when a new friend reminded me of you. She too saw you in 1997, the teenage songstress aged beyond her years, telling the world for one brief moment that teenage girls are complex creatures, not simply the cap and catty stereotypes you see at the movies. She reminded me of the girl I wanted to be before I even knew that girl was that a girl was what I was. Fiona Apple, you helped me, you helped make that happen. And in the 10 years since I remembered that I had forgotten about you, I've seen you create even better art to a smaller audience, no longer bound to the pop stardom machine because you called it what it was. Bullshit. Dear Fiona, find Lord and take care of her. She needs someone to tell her that she's on the right path to remind her that she got it right the first time, that the world she now treads is truly bullshit, that her green light may paint the road to the end of her pop stardom, but not necessarily the end of our artistic journey. Remind her that you've been on this road before 
and that you can succeed by never letting the bastards grind you down. Can I make a request? Oh yeah. Art is dead. Art is dead. You can find out this There we go. This uh, this was originally recorded as a techno song. Because that's how I roll. There used to be a heart in here, a part of us that cared for beauty. Now beauty's dead and we're all chasing open legs and easy lays. There used to be a soul in here. When words were said, they held their meaning. Nowadays, words fall like rain. Nothing is said and no one's listening. We're all too busy chasing Miley or bitching about Kanye West. We never take the time to notice that art is dead and we all killed it. We used to create works of passion, songs and pictures that conveyed feelings. I can't believe we fully lost that. The collective human soul is nearly dead. But I don't believe that art is dead. I just don't understand this lifestyle. Hennessy and banging strippers, chasing fame. There's no tomorrow. Burn through cash like MC Hammer. TMZ outside my door, wondering what drugs I'm on, or if I even bother to put on underwear today. There used to be a damn good reason an artist would ever turn to drugs. Nowadays, we're all just loaded at the strip club, making it rain calling women tricks and hoes, degrade ourselves, acting like dogs, team team raps, and I can auto-tune the top 40 porno soundtrack. But I don't believe that art is dead. So I'm pretty sure that we're all sick of the shootings, the mass shootings, the school shootings, the anywhere you can take a gun shootings. This is a piece um, about the Second Amendment. The Second Amendment, according to some, guarantees a gun in the hand of every American. You get a gun, and you get a gun, and you get a gun. Everybody gets a gun. Yay, guns! Except that's not what the Second Amendment guarantees at all. It actually says that a militia made up of private citizens assembled for the purpose of maintaining peace in their community shall not have their rights to bear arms and fringe. In other words, this amendment is fairly useless in a modern context. It never says anything about private citizens having unlimited access to firearms. It doesn't even really say that owning a gun is a basic human right. It says that if you're a member of a private citizen militia in an area where your presence is necessary to the security of your neighborhood, you should be allowed to keep and bear firearms. If anything, this amendment would apply to groups such as the Black Panthers, who took to maintaining law and order on the streets of black neighborhoods because the local police couldn't be trusted to protect the interests of, black, of the black community. Huey P. Newton had more rights to a gun than Charlton Heston ever will. But we don't call Charlton Heston a terrorist, do we? And this statement so offended a uh, vendor at a venue that I was at that he decided that he needed to make that known. So I wrote this in response. Your flag is red, your flag is blue, your flag is white, and so are you. Placed atop your concessions truck, you have just made a political statement at the so-called family event. So when you shout at me as a coward in the distance that my politics have no place here, may I remind you that flag on your truck is a political statement. The American flag is not a benign symbol. It is the authoritarian reinforcement of a jingoistic value system that demonizes the other and upl uplifts the privilege of the white male, whom you just happen to be sitting in your truck, shouting at me as a coward in the distance, trying to silence a dissenting voice because your flag is your politics. And you support the system that I speak out against. If gun control and civil rights are words that children's ears should never hear, then gun violence, slavery, discrimination, and segregation are even greater crimes against our children. Silence will not end this injustice. Waiting for an allegedly appropriate hour to speak only, de only results in delays and deference. Tools the white man uses to hold everyone else down, tone policing our anger, calling out, calling our demonstrations at public events inappropriate, 
If now is not the time to discuss my civil rights, white man, then when is? When does the marginalized citizen's mere existence stop being political long enough to have a proper conversation about my rights? It doesn't. So I will stand here as a trans woman and speak my piece for the children's ears to hear because it's only then my voice will carry weight. For when your children learn of the injustices you've allowed in the name of preserving white America, then you, they will learn what we have always known that your flag is a tool of oppression we face every single day living under it. And the promises of this nation, that the promises this nation makes to your children, that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by the creator with certain inalienable rights, that among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Every last word of that is a lie, and the flag sits upon your truck is a reinforcement of that lie. I will not protect your lives for the sake of your children. I will speak the truth to power for every child in this nation to hear because they deserve to be told the truth about you, about the flag that sits upon your truck, the political statement that you wave in my face to oppress and silence me. When I take this mic, I am no longer at a family event. It is an educational seminar about the real America, the America that is red and yellow and brown and black and covered in rainbows. The America that your flag doesn't represent. Your flag drips with red blood on the hands of white skin, burying the shameful blue underneath its white stars. And I will not stand silent in the face of your political statement any longer. <laughs> Do we have time for one more? Yeah, yeah. Go, go for one more. Okay, a preview from the theme that you can buy. Grandada. It is, uh, the, for, the foreplay is called Birth, Life, Death, Forever. And I think the title kind of gives away what we're talking about here. This is life. Dress rehearsals are for amateurs. Life is a stage and you are a player. The main character of the story that is your life and the genre of your story is as ill-defined as your character. Your life has no discernible plot and you're often not even the focus. The best lines always go to someone else, and lucky you, you don't even get a script. You have to improvise your way through this mess of a play called life, and you have to do it live every night with a new scenario every single time until the day you die. Mm. If your life was a book, it'd be practically unreadable, assembled together by a team of incompetent writers, only one of which gets to be you. No proofreader, no editor, no publisher, no distributor. You might have a dozen readers at best, and they only read the good chapters. Hey, look at me, I'm a novel that nobody reads. Because nobody wants to read books. They wait for it to be made into a movie. A movie that's about as faithful to the source material as your ex-girlfriend who left you during pre-production to pursue a career as the lenient lady in someone else's studio feature. Your novel sucks, the movie's even worse, and you can't escape any of this. Because this is your life, and you only get one take. Because dress rehearsals are for amateurs. Ooh.